Welcome to the latest installment of the AST AJT Journal Club series. Today's Journal Club is hosted by the AST Infectious Disease Community of Practice. In a moment, I will turn the discussion over to our moderator, Dr. Deirdre Swinski from the University of Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who will introduce our presenters, Drs. Gaurav Gupta and Richard Sterling from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. But first, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's discussion. There is currently a viewership polling question displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. Please note that your lines have all been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for this recording. If you have a question during the Journal Club, please use the questions tab, which you can find near the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel. If there are questions we do not have time for, we will either answer them individually offline, or we will post the full question with the answer on the website following the Journal Club. Please be aware that if you click the X icon in the upper right of the main GoToWebinar panel, you will close and exit the webinar. This journal club is being recorded and the archive will be available within 24 hours. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's journal club, you will see a short survey to complete. We will use this information to help keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn our session over to Dr. Sawinski to begin our presentation. Thank you, Brian. Thank you to the members of the audience who've chosen to join us today for what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion of a hot topic in transplantation. Our presenters today are Dr. Gaurav Gupta, who's a transplant uh, nephrologist and the medical director of the kidney transplant program at Virginia Commonwealth University. He's the first author of the paper being presented. He's also joined by the senior author, Richard Sterling, who's the chief of the section of hepatology and professor of medicine and hepatologist at the Virginia Commonwealth University. I hope you'll agree with me that this is um, an exciting opportunity as the use of hepatitis C viremic donors in negative recipients has quickly moved from pilot research trials to general clinical practice in many settings. Um, but we've come to realize that the cost of medications has remained a barrier to widespread uptake of this practice. And so the authors will present a novel approach um, to this problem, the use of DAAs in a prophylactic setting. Um, this presentation, as said, was sponsored by the AST Infectious Disease Community of Practice, and we thank, you, thank them for bringing this important paper to um, the attention of the general AST membership. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Gupta. Uh, to begin the presentation. Thank you, Deirdre. Uh, thank you to the AST and AJT for the invitation to present our work. We do have a few disclosures about this work. Some of this work was supported by the VCU President's Research Quest Fund and Gilead Pharmaceuticals. So I'm going to start with some background and turn it over to Richard, my uh, colleague, uh, uh, in a few slides. So as uh, many of us in the audience know, that hepatitis C positive organs uh, have been a source of significant kidney discard for many years. Uh, in this uh, well-known paper by Reese et al. from Penn, over a period of 10 years between 2005 and 14, almost 500 kidneys per year were thrown away because of the absence of available uh, recipients. <clears throat> and that was a trigger for considering the question can we actually use these hep C positive kidneys for hep C negative recipients, particularly with the advent of the new drugs which would have become available? So most of you know that the uh, older treatments for uh, hepatitis C included interferon, which were contraindicated in the post-kidney transplant setting. And shown here is our evolution of our direct acting antivirals, or DAAs. So hepatitis C was first discovered uh, in the 1970s, and we first had an antibody test for it in the early 1990s. As you can see in this slide, we've gone from the earlier um, interferon days that contained some of these newer DAAs through to our current era where we have several interferon-free DAAs. Uh, the most recent ones are both uh, Maverick, uh, also called GP, and Vosevi that were just approved a few years ago. So now in our arsenal, we have many interferon-free agents uh, that can treat our hepatitis C patients. 
The problem, as was already mentioned, is that initially when these DAAs first became available, they were cost prohibitive to a lot of patients. Even in many of my hepatitis C alone patients, um, sometimes getting the medications th through insurance was difficult. So shown here is a study that was published in 2015 in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And you can see, depending on the treatment strategies for both genotypes 1, 2, and 3, if we look and focus on the interferon-free error uh, medications, which are pr primarily the bottom in each of the categories, you can see that the incremental cost relative to the usual care, although initially was very expensive when these agents first came out, uh, even with a decrease in cost over time, the cost is still expensive with uh, anywhere from uh, you know, $14,000 incremental cost per usual care. So for some patients, just getting these medicines has been difficult. This slide shows the insurance or denial of these DAAs, and this is from 2016. So the data is a couple years old, but overall, as you can see in these stacked bars, the dark a portion represents the absolute uh, denial of a DAA where the medication was um, uh, completely denied by the insurance company and the white part of the stack bars is the denial after uh, they, there was a, re a request to speak uh, directly for an appeal. And overall you can see about 16% of patients had absolute uh, denial and about 30% of patients had denial uh, after um, even after the appeal by their provider. And this was much higher in the Medicaid population uh, where a lot of the DAAs were uh, limited to uh, certain patients based on their state of formulary and criteria. But even those with Medicare and commercial had denial rates that were unacceptably high. So we, before we moved on to this project, we wanted to look at the historical evidence behind using Hep C positive, uh, and in, in, in that area it was antibody positive kidneys for Hep C negative recipients. And we uh, looked at this in the UNOS national database uh, over a period of 20 years, uh, with the most recent date of enrollment being 2014. And we found that uh, close to 700 such transplants were performed in that era. Of those, we had followed data on 421. And we matched these patients to controls who were waitlisted. Uh, at, the, at the same time as the patients who received deep positive R negative transplants, and we looked at their outcomes uh, in the historical cohort when DAAs were probably not available to these patients. And we were surprised to find that even in that era when DAAs were not available, these patients who received these deep positive transplants actually had a better survival compared to patients who stayed on the wait list suggesting uh, to us that this was probably a plausible scenario. And the this, this data also helped us uh, uh, when we started talking to patients to consent them for uh, these transplants. So with that background, uh, there have been two uh, pilot trials on this, uh, and these were landmark trials. The first one was from Penn by Goldberg et al. Uh, and this was called the Thinker trial. They enrolled 10 patients with the trial. They only targeted hep C genotype 1 donors because the drug they had for the study was uh, this one, which is uh, commercially called Zepatir. And in this trial, they enrolled these 10 patients, they transplanted them, and all of, all of these patients became hep C positive by day three based on hep C PCRs. And then they were treated with 12 weeks of Zepatir, and all of them did achieve sustained virological remission at 12 weeks post-therapy, and there were no real study-associated adverse events. The next trial was from Hopkins, and it was called Expander 1, and there were two differences between this trial and the, and the one from, from Penn. Once again, 10 patients were enrolled. The difference was, one, they started the drug, Zepatir, before the transplant. It was given within quotes on call, meaning a few hours before transplant, and then it was continued for 12 weeks post-transplant. So it was within codes of uh, a prophylactic regimen, so to speak. But then they also enrolled patients uh, with donor genotypes beyond one. What they did was that for genotype two and three, they added sofuspavir to the Zepatia regimen. Uh, and they found, once again, that everybody did achieve SVR12 in this trial. And once again, there were no treatment-associated adverse events in this trial. 
there were two interesting things about this trial which are worth pointing out. The first one was that they did have patients with known one genotypes uh, in the donors, suggesting that a pangenotypic drug would probably be useful moving forward in other trials. And second, that even by week one, most of these patients were hep C virus negative, uh, suggesting to us at least, when we started designing our trial, that maybe shorter courses would be effective in preventing hep C transmission if started prophylactically. So since we completed our trial, there have been some other real world experiences on this topic. The first paper is from uh, UT Memphis, and they transplanted uh, 53 patients, and they went to the insurance company to get drug approval, which took an, on an average of two months post-transplant. What they did notice was this delay in therapy may have resulted in close to 20% of the patients developing de novo dose for donor-specific antibody and developing transaminitis and elevated LFTs. One patient in this trial also developed fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis. This has also been confirmed by another group in uh, Florida, Cleveland Clinic, and they found that two patients treated with the real-world protocol of delayed therapy developed fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis. Uh, there's one last paper which just came out recently where all organs were studied, and one of their patients was a non-responder to uh, their DAA drugs due to NS5A resistance. So overall, there seems to be some cost to delaying therapy uh, beyond the first few days of transplant based upon this limited evidence. So with that background, we uh, termed our trial called the DAPA trial with the hypothesis, can shorter courses of DAA prophylaxis eliminate or at least minimize hep C transmission? And this was a single center non-randomized trial which was registered in clinicaltrials.gov. This was a trial design. So what we did initially, and uh, we'll talk about how our patients were approached, but there were patients who were then enrolled into the study. And for the first group, which were just 10 patients, they got two doses of soft vel, sofosavir and uh, velpatasvir, which again is a pan-genotypic, DAA regimen, single pill taken daily. They got one on the day of the transplant on call as they were heading to the uh, operating room, and they got one on the first day post-transplant. So two total doses, and then these patients were followed um, very closely uh, at days three, seven, and then at uh, week two and week three and on for the development of HCV RNA. And in this pilot uh, initial trial, where patients were enrolled uh, in groups, if any one of the patients had developed a persistently positive hepatitis C RNA, uh, then they got started on um, a full course of a DAA regimen. Once we finished with that and it was approved by our DSMB, group 2A patients were enrolled. These were 15 patients. In this group, they also received Epclusa or soft vel, but instead of two days, they got four days. They got one on the day of transplant, and then they got their uh, three additional doses on day uh, one through three post-transplant. Here, the Epclusa was uh, supplied by Gilead. In the first uh, uh, round of treatment, um, we had no uh, support from any drug company. Again, if any patient developed ATV RNA uh, on two consecutive measurements uh, after they got started on a full course of treatment. Now, once we concluded with group 2A, we needed to confirm our results. So this was our post-trial validation phase, and these were a group of 25 patients following exactly the same protocol as 2A. Again, if any patient uh, became ATV RNA positive on two consecutive uh, measurements done uh, just within days of each other, then they got initiated on hepatitis C treatment. So this is a consort flowchart of uh, the DEPA trial in group one and group two A. Uh, both of these arms, we were actively targeting patients who might derive the maximum advantage of reducing the wait time. And we defined those as the inclusion criteria that included an age above 60, or an age below 60 with at least one or more of these comorbidities like diabetes, heart disease, vascular disease, and a history of stroke. 
Uh, in uh, group one, we excluded patients with previous transplants. Uh, in group 2A, one transplant was allowed. In both the arms, we excluded patients who were not on dialysis because they did not have substantial wait time and they could afford to wait uh, for less riskier uh, transplants within quotes. Uh, patients who were already infected with HIV, Hep C, or Hep B were excluded. Patients with living donors were excluded, and patients with the, who were sensitized with a CPRA of more than 20% were excluded from uh, these two groups. Uh, and we had an active data safety monitoring board, uh, which uh, met uh, and reviewed the data once a month uh, throughout the conduct of these two uh, groups. Uh, for group 2B, we, had, we opened up uh, the, uh, the trial to all active waitlisted patients as long as they met the criteria which I listed on the last slide. Everybody did sign an approved informed consent. We had enrolled 83 patients into the study, and by the time we published uh, this paper, 25 of those had received these transplants, and that is the data we present in this paper. So a big question which has come up is why did we choose uh, this ultra-short prophylactic regimen with the Pluza? Uh, and that is based on a, on a combination of uh, both feasibility as well as uh, biologic plausibility. The first was that we theorized that the inoculum of hep C with the kidney may be small. The kidney is not really the reservoir of hep C, the liver is. Uh, as I showed before, the early Hopkins data suggested that even at post-op day seven, a majority of patients were already net negative, suggesting that maybe shorter courses may be effective. Uh, when we designed this trial, Eplosa was the only drug that was available, uh, which was pan-genotypic. We wanted to avoid waiting for donor genotyping, minimize cold time, and minimize kidney discard. Eplosa is not approved for those with renal failure with GFRs below 30, so we wanted to avoid prolonged courses, which might cause toxicity. And we also wanted to minimize drug resistance as well as drug-drug interactions. There was no data on the safety uh, and drug interactions between Eplosa and tacrolimus or mycophenolates, which all our patients get as center of care. And finally, we want to reduce the cost of care. Uh, we want to reduce the risk of insurance denial. At the time when we designed this trial, the, the usual cost of one patient's hep C therapy was close to $50,000 plus. So shown here then uh, is our drug treatment for the hepatitis C. So in group one, these were the initial 10 patients that got two prophylactic doses. Um, because of logistics, uh, we were able, at the time of donor acquisition, we were able to obtain additional samples for HCV RNA and for HCV genotype. But again, those were not available uh, to us at the time of the transplant. They were available to us uh, later on that week. So in group one, um, if they developed HCV RNA, they got treated with uh, albatazvir and grisopavir or um, zepatir, uh, again, and that was if they had genotype 1. And we chose that regimen because we knew that it was safe in renal patients, and we had data from both the Thinker and the Expander trial about the efficacy uh, soon after kidney transplant. For the non-genotype 1 patients, they got uh, soft vel or, or abclusive because, again, at the time, that was the only um, non-agenotype 1 all-oral regimen that was available. And during this initial uh, group 1, the drug was provided free by VCU. In group 2A patients, where, which was the 10 patients that got, excuse me, the 15 patients that got uh, four doses, here, we were able to do genotype and resistance testing uh, once the patients uh, developed uh, HCV uh, RNA uh, before we were able to initiate their 12 weeks of therapy. All patients in this group got Ebclusa with or without ribavirin, depending on their genotype and if they had a uh, NS5AY93H mutation. And again, for this phase, for those 15 patients, the uh, drug was, uh, was provided to us for both the four doses plus any patient that needed by Gilead. In the open phase 2B, again, we were able to do resistance testing in any patient that developed HCV RNA after their four days of CLUSA. But by this time, there were some additional agents that were available to us. So for these patients, we were able to use um, GP or Maverick 
um, through the patient's insurance company um, for this group. So these are the demographics uh, of the uh, 50 patients who were enrolled in the study. And I just want to walk through you through a few things. The first is uh, to point out that these patients had significant comorbidities. Um, a large majority of these patients had diabetes or heart disease. Only three of these patients were previous transplants, and that's relevant to uh, the question of who developed viremia, and we will discuss that in the next few slides. What I want to point out is this uh, interesting difference between the pre-enrollment wait time, which was on an average 2.1 years prior to enrollment, which dropped down to 30 days post-enrollment to transplant. So there was a dramatic uh, difference in access to transplants for patients who were willing to uh, participate and who met our criteria for enrollment. The other thing I'd just like to point out is that we did do liver elastography uh, on all of our patients prior to them uh, going uh, as part of the protocol. And you can see here, the stiffness numbers are well in the range of no significant liver fibrosis. And also I'd like to point out that 38% um, of our patients were genotype one, but many of our patients were non-genotype one, again, suggesting a pan-genotypic regimen is what you need to go with if you're gonna offer treatment uh, starting on the day of transplant, because genotype is not available um, then. So this is sort of the money slide about what the viral transmission outcomes are. So in our first phase of 10 patients, we had a 30% transmission. That means of those 10 patients, 30% of them developed HV RNA and, and required hepatitis C treatment. Because of that uh, pilot phase, we learned that two days was not enough, and therefore we went into phase 2A, which was four days of Epclusa. And here, the transmission rate dropped to 13%, so more than 50% drop by just adding those two additional days. And for confirmation, uh, we found in phase 2B of our 25 open-label patients, their transmission rate dropped a little bit further, even to 4%. And again, this is in distinction to the um, um, Thinker trial, where 100% of patients would develop HCV pyremia if you didn't do anything at the time of transplant. So overall, our transmission, just looking at group 2A and 2B, uh, for those 40 patients, our transmission was 3 out of the 40 or 7.5%, and you can see the 95% confidence interval around that point estimate. So again, as you can see by this uh, uh, graph, in group 1 with the 30%, uh, two days is clearly not enough, but if you expand it to four days, you can see a drop. It's not clear why group 2B in the open label uh, had a 4% as opposed to 2A had a 13%, um, but certainly that's both uh, around the point estimate. So our overall transmission rate in our entire cohort of uh, those patients uh, was 12% overall, and only 7% in the four-day group. Shown here is what happens to the liver in these patients. As you can see here in the two groups, group one are the initial 10 patients who we just received two doses of prophylactic uh, DAA in the um, red triangles, and then group 2A in the green uh, circles and group 2B in the blue uh, squares. You can see that some of them initially post-transplant may have had a mild increase in their liver enzymes, but as you can see here, this is looking again at the ALT. No one uh, develop significant hepatitis. Um, uh, most of the values are still well within the normal range for this group. And you can see similarly for the AST, you can see again, there's a slight increase early on, but that may not be related to the liver since AST is not liver specific. But you can see again, no one developed any cl clinically significant uh, hepatitis during the group. Shown here, then, are the virologic characteristics and the outcomes of those who developed hepatitis C. So first, for the first 10 patients, which is patient 3, 4, and 9, they all were genotype 1A. This was in the first group who only received two doses. You can see that between the time they um, got uh, their kidney transplant and the time we were actually able to get them on treatment, again, this is after they broke through the two days, was three weeks, 
Uh, we, were, we did not do resistance testing as part of the protocol. Again, in this protocol, all these patients, if they needed a full course of treatment, got uh, Zepatier, and two of the three patients had an SVR12, while one patient did not. Shown here in this uh, last column are the HCV resistant testing, and you can see for the patients that did develop HCV viremia, despite being uh, treated, he had a lot of mutations, including the NS34Y93H mutation, the Q80K, as well as uh, several NS5A mutations. Secondly, uh, in additional patients which uh, developed the breakthrough in the uh, second phases, which were patients 12, 22, and uh, in, in cohort 2B, patient number 32, you can see here the genotype pattern was a little bit mixed. There was one of each. Again, the time to start their full course of DEA treatment, uh, again, was about three weeks. Um, some of them he here did have resistance testing uh, at baseline of starting treatment. It's not clear whether these were present prior to receiving their kidney transplant because we did not have serum at that time. You can see the regimens for this group. So in group 2B, uh, every patient got soft VEL and the genotype 3 patient with the Y93H mutation also got ribavirin. And in the last patient, the one patient in group 2B that broke through, he got GP. And all three of these patients had sustained virologic response. Shown here is a, the, viral, the, the viral characteristics, again, of uh, patients 3, 4, 22, and 32. Again, they got their first-line DAA. You can see here the viral load will go up. All patients that we had in this trial who developed HCV of viremia did so within the first 14 days of transplant after they received their initial prophylactic dose. Um, these were the patients that had an initial response. The viral load went to negative, but then the patients relapsed. They got retreated in this particular group. The second DAA regimen that they took was soft Velvox or Vosevi. Uh, we felt that was the best chance that they had. And again, all those patients were sustained virologic responder. Shown on this slide are the two patients uh, that didn't have that outcome. So again, this is patient 9 and patient 12. Again, they initially were negative until day 7 uh, after their, in patient 9, 2 days, and in patient 12, 4 days of Epclusa. Um, then what happened here is this particular patient had a rejection episode and was treated um, during, while we initiated their initial line of treatment. Again, usually um, uh, soon after we determined they were repeatedly a positive. As you can see here in patient 12, he had a nice decline, was undetectable at week eight, completed his course of treatment, but unfortunately relapsed. At that point, he was given a second course of therapy um, as opposed to, and he is uh, still HCV RNA uh, negative. Patient nine, uh, every, every trial has one of these, and this is ours. Patient nine was a little harder. As you can see here, the patient did have uh, his uh, viral load, didn't go as high, as the other patient. He did have a drop, but he never got to negative. And despite him telling us he was compliant and having no normal kidney and tacrolimus levels, uh, we're not quite sure of his compliance because he uh, never went to zero and became positive. He got retreated uh, with a second course of treatment. Again, had a nice virologic decline, but never went to undetectable and unfortunately broke through. He's currently uh, getting ready to start his third course of treatment. So with regards to the graft uh, itself, uh, you can see that uh, group one had a, a lower rate of data graft function than group two, and this is largely because in group two we were willing to accept more imported kidneys than we were in group one. We waived off the, uh, the absolute requirement for getting donor samples at the time of transplant, which opened up uh, more transplant offers to our patients, but because of the prolonged cold time, there was more radiograph function in group 2A and 2B compared to 1. We have a follow-up on an average uh, of a median of eight months uh, for this group when the study was uh, published. Across the board, despite having more cold time, the GFRs in these three groups are not statistically different uh, at this time. There was one patient in group 1 who did have hep C viremia, 
and that's the patient who remains a non-responder, who did have acute T-cell meter rejection. He was treated with thymoglobulin. It's unclear how much the thymo played a role in his non-response. There was uh, a second patient in group 2A with without viremia. He did not have any viremia. He did have rejection. He was not treated with thymoglobulin. He was treated only with pulse steroids because of an active uh, bacteremic wound, uh, wound infection and went on to lose his transplant and did uh, develop the uh, donor-specific antibody also. Uh, and that is also the one graft loss we have in the study. There were a total of three patients who, do, who developed de novo donor specific antibody uh, in this uh, study. Of those two, had spontaneous resolution of their DSA. One patient, the one who had rejection and loss of graft, did have persistent DSA. There was one patient death in the entire study. This was because of a fulminant pneumonia in group 2B in a patient without any evidence of hepatitis C viremia at the time of their death. With regard to renal outcomes, uh, as can be seen, there was uh, a lower rate of DGF, and therefore, in group one, which is the red triangles, the GFR goes up faster compared to the other two groups. But over time and follow up, the GFRs are equivalent in the three groups. Uh, so, therefore, all of these patients, on an average, maintain excellent kidney function at the time of most recent follow up. This can also be seen in a comparison here. And this is not in the paper, it was in the appendix. So we uh, had aimed to investigate and compare the outcomes of the 50 patients who received hep C positive kidneys compared to a matched group which received hep C negative kidneys. Uh, and demographics wise, there were no differences between the three groups, age wise, race wise, or KDPI wise. But similarly, GFRs were similar in these two groups at the time of most recent follow up. Once again, there is substantial missing data at the time of when they published the study because of inadequate follow-up in some patients. Moving on to a study associated adverse events, you can see the, the primary adverse event which we can attribute to the study is hep C transmission, which is 6 or 12%. There were a variety of different infectious and non-infectious complications. Uh, one could attribute the acute rejection possibly in the one patient with hep C viremia to the study but everything else uh, possibly is not study attributable and is seen uh, in our population. Uh, when we compare the incidence of the infectious complications like BK uh, or urine infections or other infections, this is very similar, uh, if not lower, compared to our general population in our center. So to conclude, ultra-short prophylaxis, in the study of a period of two to four days in the perioperative period, resulted in an overall transmission rate of 12% in the study, six of 50 patients. We demonstrate that the four-day prophylactic regimen was effective in preventing hep C transmission in a majority, but not all, hep C transplants. We also demonstrate that the prophylaxis with four doses is superior to two doses, 7.5% uh, versus 30% in the two-dose arm. Uh, we showed a low risk of de novo donor specific antibody in our study as compared to the real world experience by the UT Memphis group, uh, where the DSA formation was 20%. This is also similar to the U Penn group, where they showed DSAs uh, in 20% of their patients in the extensive study, which they published in the Annals of Internal Medicine on 20 patients. Of these three patients in our study, only one had persistent DSA, while two went on to have resolution of their DSA. We did not have any cases of fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis or significant persistent elevated LFTs uh, in our group. We do show that one of six patients did have treatment failure in our study, uh, which is uh, a substantial limitation of the study. And we are unable to attribute, we are unable to attribute this to uh, whether this was because of our prophylactic regimen or because of uh, donor resistance from the get-go, because we do not have any baseline donor viruses testing. We do not have adequate samples also to run those tests at this point. And at the current time, uh, the ideal duration of prophylaxis is uh, undetermined, although our current studies are looking at a seven-day prophylactic regimen, and those results 
will be presented in the near future at the AST as well as possible publications. So the question is, why did only a few patients develop viremia and resistance? Having said that, the sample size is too small to derive any clear associations. Only six of 50 patients developed viremia, and of those six, five had some resistance. Now, could they be donor derived or more likely due to prophylaxis? We are unable to say. We did choose Zepatir as first line treatment in group one. That may not have been the best choice uh, because it's now known that uh, more than 10% of patients with genotype one could be Zepatir resistant from the get go. The one patient who remains a non-responder, there is some concern of non-adherence uh, because of difficulty in following up with him as well as with getting lab work as well as clinic visits. Nevertheless, uh, we can't really say anything about that beyond the data we have. It's possible that there was a role of immunosuppression in the patients who broke through. It's known that hep C uh, does trigger innate immunity and clearance of hep C viremia spontaneously requires an effective na natural killer cell population. Thymoglobulin, which is the induction of choice in our patients in our center, was used for all patients and it does defeat NK cells. Uh, and we have some pointers towards that because of the six patients who broke through, five of our patients had profound leukopenia post-transplant. Of the three retransplants we did, two of those developed viremia, suggesting that cumulative state of immunosuppression may also play a role here. And then the only non-responder, which I described above, did receive additional thymoglobulin for, for uh, his T cell meter rejection episode. So I think this is the last slide. With that, we'll end. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, hand it back to Deirdre. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Sterling. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. As we are uh, welcoming your questions, please do send them uh, via the GoToMeeting um, uh, platform, and I, I'd be happy to present them to the group. Uh, so while we wait for some questions to come in, um, I was just wondering, in reference to the six patients who uh, developed uh, hep C viremia after the prophylaxis, do you think that the three to five week delay in starting uh, treatment might have in any way impacted your cure rate or the development of resistance? I mean, that that's a good question, which is probably why you asked it. Um, it's hard to it's hard to tell. I mean, in, if you look at the data of treating acute hepatitis C, um, there doesn't seem to be any drop-off with these new agents. Um, whether you treat them, you know, immediately or wait a few weeks, it's certainly possible that there was some uh, delay in uh, because of the maybe the week or two that the hepatitis C had a chance to set up shop. But again, the sample size was small, and that didn't really affect the other patients. And so um, that um, you know they cured the virus. Uh, you know, most of them we were able to cure. So I, I don't think that the couple-week delay um, made those few patients break through. Really, again, we really only have one patient so far that we've not been able to cure. So I don't, you know, everybody got the four days, and then um, when they came back at uh, day 14, they were, if they were positive, then we brought them back uh, the next week to try to initiate the treatment, and that kind of gets you to the three weeks. Okay. I'm also wondering, um, in your table one, when you had presented the breakdown of donor genotype, um, and it says that some of the donors were um, didn't have sample or inadequate viral copies for uh, resistance testing and genotype testing, I'm wondering, do you think it's conceivable that some of the people who um, were quote unquote cured by this prophylactic strategy, do you think it's possible that their donors might not really have been viremic, perhaps a, a false positive assay to start? Um, do you think that's a concern? So uh, all of these donors were hep C antibody positive also. Uh, so it's less likely they were false positive for hep C virus. Uh, we did look at the association of uh, hep C viremia as in viral loads. Uh, which is uh, described in this uh, row here, uh, and the ability to clear viremia with, four, uh, with a two- or four-day uh, course. We did not find any clear patterns that would suggest that patients with lower viral loads uh, from the donor would clear it better than patients with higher viral loads. So uh, similarly, we did not find any association with genotypes also. So I don't think so. Uh, uh, 
we are very worried about the fact that some of these donors were false positive because all of them had hep C antibody positive. Also, in addition, uh, a large majority of them had active IV drug use. So once again, their, histo their patient history was consistent with the fact that they could and were carrying hep C. And again, you know, the problem with, with this entire process is that you don't have these results available to you uh, often until after the surgery is done. Um, and as they say, there's no backsies. So you've got to, you know, assume that, that they were viremic, um, but often you don't know because it takes time. I mean, even, even in the best of cases, it takes um, a minimum of six hours to do the HVR RNA testing, and you don't want to do anything to delay, you know, putting the kidney in. And uh, one last point is that the patients with, within course, no detectable viral load in their blood, uh, those kidneys were accepted from donors which were out of state. Uh, we looked at the pattern, and most of them, the blood had been sitting out for a long time, so that may have resulted in degradation of the hep RNA. But once again, these are theories and conjectures. Okay. Well, uh, we have some great questions from the audience. Uh, this question is from Dr. Bala. Um, asking, uh, could you have not chosen a different duration of prophylaxis based on the anticipated renal recovery? Um, the idea being giving longer duration to patients with immediate graft function since the concern for choosing only four days was based on a fear of accumulation due to renal dysfunction. Do you think this would have decreased the infection incidence? So yes, you know, uh, I think one is it's difficult to predict who will and who won't have immediate or renal graft function. Uh, Having said that, uh, in theory, that would be possible, and I think in, in a real-world experience, that may be doable. Uh, in our trial, this was a protocolized trial. We did not have any, uh, any leverage in changing the protocol based upon graft function. Our current protocol is seven days of prophylaxis, which seems to lower the rate of transmission even more to almost 0%, which, uh, but I won't speak to that. So I do agree that uh, uh, that uh, Longer courses are better. The question is how much uh, is better than, uh, say, 12 weeks, because through 12 weeks, conceivably, you're getting to 0%. But then that defeats the purpose of avoiding the issue of uh, the prolonged duration of therapy as well as reducing the cost of uh, transplants. Uh, in our experience, uh, our patients uh, have been a lot more interested and willing to participate in a prophylactic strategy protocol compared to have to wanting to stay viremic. Uh, in my discussions offline with colleagues from other centers, there's been a significant amount of anxiety amongst recipients with viremia uh, with regards to getting access to the hep C drug, which can take, uh, in some cases, more than two to three months. Great. Um, in that line, uh, we have a question from both Dr. Vanita Kumar as well as Dr. David Goldberg, uh, both asking the same thing. Uh, which is related to the cost effectiveness. Um, they're both asking um, what would be the cost savings of doing four-week therapy compared uh, to 12 weeks of therapy um, and asking what the cost uh, effectiveness of your uh, strategy is. So uh, we intend to do that uh, analysis when we have adequate seven-day data available, but to give you the numbers we have from our pharmacy, so we are a 340B institution, which means that we get uh, a pretty competitive pricing from uh, companies because we take, the hospital takes care of the indigent. Uh, the cost of one tablet of Eplusa in this institution is around $200 to $300, which comes to less than $1,000 for a four-day course uh, and close to $1,500 to $2,000 for a seven-day course, uh, as opposed to between $30 to $50,000 for a full 12-week course. A four-week course would be cheaper, without question. What, in internal discussions, the concern we've had is that if we go to insurance companies to ask for a four-week course and the patient breaks through after that, what kind of problems will be run into uh, beyond that? And that's why we've chosen to stay with the prophylactic regimen rather than considering the four-week course. Having said that, there are merits to the four-week course, as was published by the Brigham Group. The Brigham paper, uh, which described the four-week course, was done in thoracic transplants, where they did not use any induction regimen, no time globulin, or any other induction regimen was used. So it's unclear how that would do in abdominal transplants, 
with the immune suppression profiles we have. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Jessica Voss, who's asking, uh, did you use T-cell depleting or IL-2 receptor antagonist as your induction therapy in your study? And do you um, attribute the increase in acute rejection to the use or non-use of depleting induction um, strategy? So all our patients got T-cell depletion with thymoglobulin as per standard of care. Uh, we do dose stratify. Uh, if patients are above the age of 60, they get 4.5 mg per kilo cumulative dose, as opposed to patients below 60 who get 6 mg per kilo. Uh, so that is, there is a dose stratification there, but with regards to uh, T-cell depletion, all of them got it. The rejection risk in this trial was 4%, which is lower than our institutional rejection risk of 8 to 10% per annum. Okay, um, let's see. So there's a lot of interest about induction. Um, another uh, question from Alex B. Golovin asking, was there any difference in prophylaxis with Eclipsa versus Maverick in groups 2A and 2B regarding the development of viremia? So all the patients in group 2, whether 2A or 2B, they all got Eclipsa uh, for four days. The difference between 2A and 2B is that in 2A patients, the few patients that develop breakthrough of viremia got treated with Epclusa versus group 2B patients where we made a change because at that point, Maverick was uh, now available. Uh, there was some data that showed that it was uh, safe in post-kidney transplant. So in group 2B, the few patients that needed treatment ended up getting um, GP. So, but all of them in groups A, 2A, and 2B, they all got Eclusa up front for either two days or four days, depending on the group they were in. Okay, we also have a question from Dr. Zayas asking about if there was any relationship seen between um, those who had reactivation of hepatitis C and CMV viremia. No, uh, we did not see any association like that. I don't think so. I have the numbers for CMV on the slide. Uh, but, uh, and I'll have to get back to confirm that, uh, which I can to, uh, with, with an email to Dr. Zayas, but I'm 99% sure that there was no such association seen. Okay. Um, we have a question uh, regarding, um, based on your experience, how long does it take to get your resistance testing back? Yeah, so uh, we can get our ATV RNAs done, you know, fairly quickly. Genotypes uh, usually take a few days after that. But resistance testing, uh, at least at our institution, is still a send-out test um, through LabCorp, and that takes uh, a couple of weeks, either two or three weeks, depending. Okay. Uh, we also have a question about the mechanics of the trial, um, asking about how you guys uh, chose an internal versus external uh, DSMB, um, and concern about the patient who was uh, unable to be cured of their hepatitis C. Yes. So in uh, the first pilot phase, uh, the the phase A or the group A patients, that was all done internally. We had zero external funding uh, for that. Um, the uh, DSMB was made up of uh, transplant uh, physicians uh, that were not uh, involved in any way in uh, recruiting the patients or treating the patients, and so they were independent. That included a transplant hepatologist, a uh, uh, transplant, I mean, a uh, nephrologist, and a transplant cardiologist or a cardiac surgeon, uh, and they were the ones who reviewed the data. Um, so we decided uh, that we could do, and our IRB agreed that we could do a, uh, a DSMB from within, from within the institution as long as those providers had no, um, nothing to do with the study. They didn't enroll patients, they didn't treat patients, and they didn't see the patients. Uh, I think that was the first answer. Was there a second part of that question? Um, there was a question, uh, obviously, concern regarding the fate of the patient who has been um, rendered incurable of their hepatitis C, currently the, the non-responder. Yeah, so, um, you know, he's, our, he's a challenging patient. Um, and, again, I think that, um, you know, we often question whether he was compliant. I think he's the only patient out of uh, over 3,000 that I've treated with the DAAs across the spectrum since 
um, you know, early 2015 that has not been ATV RNA negative uh, during the treatment. So we certainly are concerned about um, compliance. Um, his treatment also has been a little bit uh, um, uh, frustrating for us because uh, after he got his kidney transplant, he, he felt so good being off dialysis, he wanted to take some time off and do some traveling uh, with his family. And so just getting him back into clinic has been a little bit of a challenge. Um, so um, sometimes, um, you know, if you're going to open this up, um, you just have to, you know, take what you get when it comes to patient enrollment. But I think uh, certainly this, you know, can happen with any, you know, with any study. Okay. We also have a question from the audience regarding maintenance immunosuppression. Would you propose using your usual standard regimen or uh, alter it, reduce it in any way? So, no, everybody got standard of care immunosuppression. In general, we do reduce mycophenolates uh, by one to three months post-transplant. In, uh, in patients who uh, are uh, have a smaller body frame, typically patients below 80 kilos will go down the mycophenolate uh, uh, from two grams a day down to 500 milligrams twice a day over one to three months post-transplant. But that is, again, as per our standard of care. It wasn't, uh, we did not alter immunosuppression in any way for the patients enrolled in the study. Okay. Um, so, obviously, we, we've learned a lot from your experience, and it sounds like you have, too. Um, so, I guess I'd like to ask you, how long do you think is, is long enough, realizing this is, you know, a, an ongoing moving target and, and different studies suggest different things. Do you, do you think it's a week, five days, two weeks? Any thoughts? So at the current time, we are doing seven days of prophylaxis. Our transmission rate is close to zero. We don't have adequate follow-up to be able to say that for certainty, but uh, I'll, I'll let Richard speak about this more. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, you could take two approaches to this. Um, you know, after we had designed and started our trial, the um, uh, article, both both the Thinker and the Expander trials came out. Our trial was already well underway. Um, also, there was some data in heart transplants that four weeks seemed to be sufficient. Um, so that raised the question that maybe lesser than the typical 12 weeks. Um, as you know, the standard treatment for most patients now, uh, at least using the GP regimen, um, is eight weeks. Um, so again, you can either take the strategy to start with the normal and keep kind of backing down. We did learn that in uh, DAA patients, six weeks was insufficient. So there is uh, some problem uh, by doing that too much. We decided to take the strategy to start at the lower end uh, and try to find the minimal. We started with two. We realized that that wasn't uh, going to work. Then we went to four and it was better, but it wasn't good enough. Uh, and so now we're at seven. There are some strategies that perhaps you can augment the um, the uh, drugs. Uh, and there was something presented at the liver meeting by the Toronto group with the seven-day strategy that seemed uh, to be effective. But again, their sample size was extremely small. So I think that the ideal regimen is probably a minimum of seven days, and it's probably no longer than four weeks. And so then it just becomes, you know, what's the sweet spot? Um, again, it's kind of depending on who's paying for the medication. Um, and for our study, uh, we're able to supply the medication for seven days. Um, you know, each center is going to have to determine if uh, they can't get the medicine and they provide it, does that extra cost uh, affect their, you know, a margin and what are they willing to, you know, put up with or accept? So um, I think somewhere between seven days and, uh, and 28 days um, and I think, and I'm not sure exactly where it is in there. Okay. Are there any other questions from the audience? I will say that um, I, I, of course, see all the viremic patients. I, I don't see the ones, again, uh, if they don't uh, develop um, the, uh, the virus. Um, what we didn't really show uh, today, uh, and I think this was also shown in the expander trial, is that many of these patients do not develop hepatitis C antibodies, so that's not a very good marker to document uh, post-transplant uh, viremia. So our data supports what was seen in the expander trial. 
But all these patients, the, the patients that I saw, um, all of them, when I see them, I ask them, was it worth it? And each one equivocally has said yes. Um, they're so happy to be um, off dialysis. They feel great, and uh, they feel um, like this was the best thing for, for them. Okay, we got one more question in under the wire, um, asking, now that Maverick is cheaper uh, than uh, Epcluza, do you foresee Maverick uh, for your future trials instead of Epcluza for prophylaxis? Sure, I think that either one uh, is probably fine. Um, uh, Epclusa now is also approved uh, for patients with renal failure, so the kidney function issue early on is not as big a deal as it was when we first got started. Um, I think as long as you pay attention to pill burden and potential drug-drug interactions, um, which um, GP might have more drug-drug interactions, and it, it, it is three pills as opposed to one pill, but that regimen is probably perfectly acceptable, but again, the duration will need to be determined whether it's, you know, seven days or 28 days or longer. Probably no, you know, no more than eight weeks like you would for any. Um, but again, it just, but you know, the drug prices seem to vary. We can sometimes get, Epclusa actually is the cheapest per pill than uh, per day, uh, at least at our center, than Maverick. Another thing right. is that, I guess you also have to watch out for the rare patient who can't be on a tacrolimus-based regimen. Absolutely. One last point about the same thing is that uh, we uh, had to make a significant effort to get Epclusa. None of the DAs were on the formulary on the inpatient side here. So we had to have substantial amount of uh, efforts put in, multiple meetings and so on, to get the Epclusa on the formulary. Uh, and uh, to go back and try to get Maverick in the formulary when there is no clear benefit per se from what we can tell uh, seems not to be worth the effort uh, on our side. Sure. No one can definitely imagine that there are operational considerations that may come in besides cost. Um, and then we have one last question uh, regarding the need for HCC surveillance in your population. So, and what your plans for that are? So, obviously, for the patients that don't develop uh, hepatitis C, that's not an issue at all. Um, for the patients that, um, you know, all these patients did not have significant fibrosis to begin with. Um, and so, certainly for the patient, the, the ones that we were able to cure quickly, um, you know, fibrosis um, usually takes decades and not weeks. So, I'm not worried at all about the patients that we were able to cure. Um, the one patient that's still viremic that we are getting ready to retreat again, um, certainly maybe someone, uh, if we can't clear his virus, uh, might be at risk, and we'll have to consider that uh, with a repeat assessment of his liver uh, if we're not able to cure him and then stratify him by uh, um, if he has, if, if, he, if uh, ATC surveillance is even indicated. But for the other patients, uh, the other 49 patients, it's not an issue. Great. Well, I'd like to thank on behalf of the audience, our presenters, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Sterling, for um, a great discussion of your manuscript and uh, some lively conversation about it. Uh, it's been enlightening as always, and thank everyone in the audience for attending this installation of the AST ASTS Journal Club. Thank you all. Thank you. AST would also like to thank the presenters, Dr. Gupta, Sterling, and Sawinski, uh, for their excellent presentation today. And also, we would like to thank all of our attendees for joining us. Please remember to complete the evaluation survey and visit myast.org slash journal club to view our video archives and register for our upcoming journal clubs. If there was a question we did not have time for today, we will either answer it individually offline or post the full question with the answer on the website following the journal club. To learn about AST's IDCOP, please visit myast.org slash COPS or connect directly to the IDCOP hub.